But what if you aren't finding coins or other helpfully, authentically, trustworthily labeled artifacts? How else can you get absolute dates? Now, for a long time, we couldn't. It was literally a revolution when Willard Libby broke the news of the possibility of radiocarbon dating and its promise of, sure, absolute dates from organic remains. Now, it didn't quite work out so smoothly. We're now on to our third radiocarbon revolution, with probably more to come. But scientific methods of establishing chronometric dates have burgeoned in recent years, and they're getting better all the time. Now, there's too many of these to review in any kind of detail, and I really don't understand how most of them work anyway. Uh, this is how radiocarbon looks, and it scares me. It is more fun, I think, to tell stories than to look at equations. So I'm going to tell you three quite different stories about three quite different objects and places using three quite different methods of absolute dating methods. We're going to do dendrochronology in Rhode Island Hall, the building in which I work at Brown University. We're going to do radiocarbon dating and the Shroud of Turin. And we're going to do thermoluminescence and tang horses on the art market. Now, dendrochronology, dendrochronology, basic time from trees. This was proposed early on, interestingly enough, by Thomas Jefferson, uh, sometimes called the father of American archaeology. Some, not all, but some trees grow a ring annually. Uh, these are called sensitive trees. Complacent trees do not. Sensitive trees reflect their environmental surroundings in these rings. Rainfall and temperature variability can be seen in the width of the rings, uh, how well the tree grew. Wider rings, better growth. Trees in the same region will show the same general patterns in their growth rings. So you can take a living tree. You can take the now. You can find a pattern, thin, fat, thin, thin, fat, and then find the same pattern on a dead tree, thin, fat, thin, thin, fat, and link back and back and back. The very sensitive bristlecone pine in California, which you see here, has a sequence extending back over 8,000 years. Irish bog oak, often found in waterlogged deposits, goes back some 5,000. Now, what does this mean? It means if we find a piece of sensitive wood in an archaeological context, we can plug it into these master sequence and, and say how old it is to the very year. If you have the right trees and you can do it, it's great. So meet the original beams of Rhode Island Hall, which following a uh, recent renovation, we've actually turned into furniture. And you see here these annual rings, thin fat, thin, thin fat. Uh, and you might be asking, so did we do formal dendrochronology? on these pieces of wood, these archaeological samples? And the answer is no, because we knew the building had been built in 1840 from documentary records. So we left it at that. Archaeological rule, don't waste effort. Number two, radiocarbon dating and the Shroud of Turin. Now, radiocarbon most basically measures the decay of the radioactive isotope of carbon, C14, in organic material. And it measures that decay from the time that it, whatever it is or was, dies to the present. So you can't radiocarbon date a rock or a metal coin, but you can date wood or charred grains or textiles. Now, in a perfect world, this radioactive clock, this rate of decay, would be constant in nature, but it is not, leading to the necessary evolution of various calculations and correlations that can correct for inconsistencies. Uh, not least interestingly enough, through comparisons with dendrochronological evidence. Nor does radiocarbon dating result in a single absolute date. Instead, you get a range, a sort of a statistical standard deviation, a plus minus factor. You're not going to get 1000 BCE, take it to the bank, that's it. But instead, you'll get 1000 BCE plus or minus some range of numbers, sometimes tighter, sometimes wider. So it's complicated. But radiocarbon dating is still a preeminent and widely employed dating technique with major laboratories scattered around the world. And it's always exciting, if always expensive, to send out samples and wait for the results to come back in. Now, radiocarbon dating has rewritten a lot of history, and it's arbitrated many an argument about when did X or when did Y happen, or, and this is often important to archaeologists, which happened first. 
But it can't always solve every mystery. One fascinating application of the technique, for example, has been to the Shroud of Turin. This is a linen cloth which displays the image of a man who bears wounds consistent with a death by crucifixion. This is the shroud you see here, and also with a black and white negative, you see the face, the body, the legs. Now, the Shroud of Turin has been associated by many with the death and the burial of Jesus Christ in the early years of the first century CE. Others have considered it a fake, a fraud, of some unknown date. Now, in the late 1980s, the Holy See of the Catholic Church allowed samples of the shroud to be tested at three different labs in three different countries. And that's a good practice in case of any contamination or other problems with the analysis. They all came back with a result at a 95% confidence level of a creation date for the shroud's material, the linen, of between 1260 and 1390 CE, or in other words, to at least 1200 years after the death of Christ. Now this does not make the shroud a fake or a fraud. Uh, what exactly is a fake a fake? That's something we should talk about. But nonetheless, such dates dramatically impact the nature of how the shroud might be viewed and how it might be venerated. Now, the story is still ongoing. However, uh, it's been suggested that perhaps a medieval repair, not the original shroud, was tested. Uh, and that actually is something that underlines the importance of careful sampling. You shouldn't just grab any old bit. You've got to think about what part you're going to test. Others have argued that the samples were contaminated and thus gave incorrect results. All in all, this is an excellent case study where passions run high, a lot's invested, and it's an interesting case study of the sheer range of scientific techniques, uh, from pigment studies to pollen studies, from digital imaging and enhancement to analysis of historical fabrics, of the large and still expanding arsenal of analyses that can potentially be unleashed on archaeological objects, if people have the time, the interest, and the money. Finally, a third technique and a third story, uh, thermoluminescence and the art market. Now, luminescence dating, of which thermo is just one method, in essence can provide a date of certain artifacts or soil sediments by measuring the amount of light energy stored in certain types of mineral crystals in the clay or in the dirt. So how does this work? Certain common minerals, like quartz or calcite, they store energy from the sun at a known quantifiable rate. And this energy gets trapped within the lattices of those crystals. But if you heat those crystals, like when you fire a pot, then that energy escapes. And the clock, as it were, goes back to zero. And then the minerals begin to store energy again. So what TL, thermoluminescence, does is compare how much energy an artifact displays compared to what ought to be there if it had never been heated. If something ceramic was fired 100 years ago, you're going to get a very different read than something fired 2,000 years ago. And that's good to know. Now, TL is not wildly precise in the ultimate date it can give you, so it's not always great for archaeological research purposes. But it is one very quick and reliable way to identify ceramic fakes. And I do mean fakes this time. One popular and thus much copied artifact uh, type, for example, are Tang horses. You see one here, produced in Tang, China, 618 to 907 CE. Uh, these are beautiful things, exuding, as one sales catalog put it, confidence, distinction, and charm. I mean, I would love to own one of these, as would many other people. And while many are sold on the art market, though their export is actually banned from mainland China, they sneak out through Hong Kong, uh, demand for these horses, at least for a time, began to exceed supply. And thus began a trade in fake Tang horses. So many of these were discovered that art dealers had to take steps. And if you try to buy one of these on eBay or other online art dealers, which I sincerely hope you will not do, you will find that many have the label TL tested. It's a certificate of authenticity. Your horse was not made 25 years ago. Thermoluminescence, also known as the art sleuth. So that's three stories, three techniques, 
And that's just the tip of the dating iceberg. There's a ton of other sagas and other strategies out there.